Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back to Talking Stuff on the podcast. I'm Jerry Birmingham. That's Andrew Ellis. Today was a special day in the world, especially in Ohio. So before we dive into Ohio State recruiting, Andrew, how much of the eclipse did you get to see? And did it change your life? Well, I went on a nice little walk right at three o'clock and I Mm -hmm. did check it out. Um, It was pretty cool. I wouldn't quite go as far as life changing, but um, it was pretty cool to see, though. I'm not going to lie. How much uh, were, were where you were was in the path of totality? Oh, we were right square in the middle of totality. So it was like, I think about as good as it can get. Honestly, I'm not an astrologist or astronomer, but that's that's what I've gathered from the articles I've read. Did you get photos? I did take a photo and sent it to my wife just because she's down in the Dayton area right now. Um, I mean, it, it, it just looks like a freaking circle. It's not anything crazy. But yes, I took a photo of it. Yeah, I mean, but did you put like the 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 eclipse lens in front of your phone to take the picture? I I did not know that. Okay, well then that didn't. Then, then your picture probably sucked. Let's be clear. You know what's funny is that I'm. I mean, we were in an area that was described as like ninety nine point eight per ninety nine point five percent totality, and the difference between where I live and like where my twin sister lives, like eight miles away, was night and uh, literally night and day as far as what she saw versus what we saw in my driveway we still it was still pretty cool like it's still one of those things where i think looking back as people you're gonna be like wow that was that was pretty cool um but like i don't think we got to experience it fully so i hope everyone else did the way that you did because that seems like it would have been cooler yeah i mean it was cool i i I was as i was walking there were like dogs out and some of the dogs were acting kind of funny too so like i don't know if that's plays into all this but that's something that kind of caught my eye as i was out on my uh my jaunt in the midst of all the chaos so i thought that was kind of weird yeah i noticed like the birds going weird like you know you could hear that they were getting weirdly active at that time of day thinking it was getting darker and it was pretty cool just to see it go from like normal daytime to dark and then what I'm amazed by is how the moon being so far away and then the the sun being 93 million miles away, like how quickly that changes. And, and like, it looks like it's happening in real time when I can only imagine how weird it would be up in the, you know, up there, man. Anyway, um, that's enough for that. I, I, I do want to say I hope people enjoyed it because like it's very rare you get to see things on this planet that are so unusual and so remarkable and that is pretty remarkable what i think is the most remarkable thing about it andrew is how like they know exactly the date and time to the minute that the next one's going to happen here like that's stupid like that's crazy to me yeah i I don't understand any of that stuff like i've kind of grown up interested in all that kind of stuff just because we live you know i'm in all glaze county so we live close to the neil armstrong air and space museum and all that kind of stuff but I'm I'm confused by all of it, but also very fascinated by all of it. So I agree. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, what else is pretty cool is recruiting because like predicting the next eclipse, we know exactly what's going to happen and when in recruiting all the time, uh, which is why this job has become so easy to do and everyone does it. Um, well, we'll start with Nate Roberts, who I think is um, a player that the Ohio state recruiting class has sort of revolved around in the last year, at least when it comes to tight end recruiting, uh, Keenan Bailey hosted Nate Roberts and his family again, this past weekend, Washington, Oklahoma, tight end number five ranked tight end in the country. According to rivals.com six foot five, 230 pounds. He's got all the things you look for. Ohio state views him very much in like if Kate Stover had played tight end in high school, that they think that's pretty much where, uh, Nate Roberts is and what you would be getting. And I wrote about it uh, on Monday at OhioStateRivals.com why I think uh, locking up this recruitment in the next couple of weeks is one of the most important parts, one of the most important things for Ohio State to do on the recruiting trail right now. Because if you look at the effort that Keenan Bailey has put in, if you look at the way that Ohio State has allowed the rest of the tight end board to basically dissolve around him, uh, and then that's taken to a further point on Monday night, when uh, Lakota West tight end Luca Gilbert uh, committed to Miami tonight. So now that one's off the board in the state of Ohio, but that's not something Ohio State was worried about because they are dialed in on Nate Roberts and Brock Schott out of Leo, Indiana. And 
Nate Roberts, like when they started this pursuit, Andrew, it was like, no, there's no way. He, he's committed to Notre Dame. He's from Oklahoma. His family lives in basically in Norman. Not going to not gonna happen. And now here we are a year later, and Ohio State seems like they're the team to beat. But Oklahoma, Oregon, Ole Miss, Penn State, a few others have, have hung around. His brother is now at Oklahoma playing for the Sooners. And it seems like every time he visits Ohio State, it, we hear the rumblings coming out of the trip. Like, this could be it. This could be it. And yet, it isn't. So, what is your take on where you think things are right now with Nate Roberts? And uh, do you like the way you feel about it as a fan? Um, I, I do like the way I feel about it. When he initially decommitted from from Notre Dame back in the day, I just assumed Oklahoma kid going to end up in Norman. And then I had some optimism on Ohio State. And then I found out his brother was transferring there. And I kind of got, you know, concerned again. But I think if he overlaps at all with his brother, it's only going to be like a year or something if I'm if my math is correct on that. Right now, I feel pretty good about that. Like you've said, this is the guy Keenan Bailey has been on, uh, him and Brock Schott. Really, those are the only guys we've talked about much at all. So it would be a pretty big miss if um, Keenan Bailey invested all that time into Nate Roberts and then lost him to yeah. Oklahoma or Oregon or wherever. But I, my question now is, what's the next four to six weeks going to look like? Does he get into his official visits and then make a decision? Does a decision come before that? I didn't get a chance to read your article yet today. I apologize. Um, I didn't know if you had gotten any timeline in mind or not. No, I mean I I've talked to to Nate. I've talked to people around the recruitment, and I, and the the terminology I was told was could be any time, but the official visits are still scheduled. So what does that mean? Like there are so many times when kids leave visits with the post visit glow, you know, so bright and bold, and they're like, oh, this is everything I want, and then they get home, and it's all of a sudden like, you know what? Maybe I need to take another trip here. Maybe I need to take another trip there. Oklahoma's spring game is on April 20th. I know that Nate Roberts wants to be there in uh, the stadium for the Oklahoma spring game on April 20. His brother, obviously playing at Oklahoma now, wants to make sure he's there to support family. And I get the sense that that visit will be the last visit that he takes before he makes a decision. Um, and I think ultimately... While Oregon is still there in the periphery of this recruitment, I think it's Ohio State or Oklahoma. And I'm not going to say that I think that that next visit to Oklahoma will tell the tale, but I do think that he believes and his family probably believes it's important for him to go into that trip with an open mind and saying, I'm, I want to take one good last look here. And then the sense I got was that maybe – if, if he feels good enough after that trip one way or the other, Ohio State or Oklahoma, that he could potentially cancel his visits, the other official visits, and not take them, which I think uh, whatever team was able to land him would be thrilled that that was the case because like, at some point, these recruitments that have just been like back and forth battles, they have to end. Otherwise, you'll just keep visiting here and you know visiting here, visiting there, visiting here, visiting there. And doing that in perpetuity. And at some point, like all you're doing is making your decision harder. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And if if Ohio State can uh, get him in the commitment column end of April, early May, that would be obviously phenomenal. Top target on, on the board. And then they can have the rest of the cycle to uh, to work on Brock's shot. You mentioned Luca Gilbert committing to Miami. And uh, yeah. Miami is maybe the top competition for Brock's shot. So there's a lot of kind of moving parts with this whole tight end puzzle right now. Yeah, Miami is the team that Ohio State, the people I've spoken to there, have said they were most worried about with Brock Schott. So I don't know exactly how the Hurricanes are posturing in this situation, how they're going to pr uh, promote that. I would imagine they're going to tell Brock Schott what we talked about here a few weeks ago was that there's a very real chance that Luca Gilbert turns into an offensive tackle in college at his almost six foot eight, 260 pound frame right now. Like it's going to be hard to keep him at tight end and whether or not there's whether or not Miami's telling that to Luca Gilbert, I would be shocked if they're not telling that to Brock, uh, to Brock shot and to other tight ends. So um, it will be interesting to see how it's played off because that was a very big domino here for Ohio state, because they did believe that Brock shot the biggest competition was Miami. So now you have things lining up in a way for, for the Buckeyes that maybe, uh, go Keenan Bailey's way in a in a big way. And I think because, you know, Damarion Witten, I think we can expect 
will start his Ohio State career when he gets on campus at the end of May uh, in the wide receiver room. I think there's an even better opportunity for Keenan Bailey to point to the tight end position at Ohio State and say, here's what we have, and it ain't much uh, because there's not going to be a lot of returning depth or experience when that 25 class gets on campus finally. So um, I, I think to your point, I would not be surprised if Nate Roberts – if that decision is made by the end of this month, I think that would be, uh, I think that's probably like the goal for everyone. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. You said it's uh, April 20th, the Oklahoma spring game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cause I mean, he was so, supposed to visit Ohio state this weekend for the Ohio state spring game, but now there's a big OT seven, seven on seven uh, tournament in Dallas where a lot of these kids who were expected to visit Ohio state this coming weekend and make visits elsewhere this coming weekend are no longer doing that because they're flying to Dallas and being wined and dined and being and playing you know, football in tights. So. That's right. I knew there was I knew there was something that kind of altered his plans, but that that's exactly what it was. So yeah, so we'll see a, a, probably a handful of kids who are supposed to be at Ohio State this weekend that won't be. Um, what we won't see at Ohio State for the coming weekend because the Buckeyes did so much work over the March twenty second and March twenty third weekend and the uh, March thirtieth and April first, uh, March thirty first, April first weekend is like a huge group of kids, um, like the top of the top of the top. You're going to see some hand-picked kids from around the Midwest and kids who couldn't get into town the rest of the spring, uh, including Jonah Williams, the uh, defensive back from Galveston, Texas. You're going to see him in town with Devin Sanchez. So that will be interesting. And it's it's shaping up the Jonah Williams recruitment as another Ohio State-Oklahoma battle, but also a fight where Texas is now involved. And I want to go to think of, take a look at Austin, Texas this past weekend, where it seems like Texas had pretty much every one of Ohio State's top targets or Ohio State's uncommitted targets on campus uh, in Austin this past weekend for their big scrimmage. And um, the more I think about this, Andrew, the more like in the last handful of years, we've had Ohio State going to bat a, a, a battle a lot with Notre Dame, Clemson, et cetera. I think now as the NIL era continues to evolve, we're going to see Ohio State and Texas and USC, those three schools that are really like in a city, like the, the schools that are like the major metropolis type of colleges. Um, and I'm not going to include Miami in this because it's such a small private school and uh, it's not the same as a place like Texas or, or USC or Ohio State. But I think we're going to start to see a lot of head-to-head -head battles between these schools. Texas obviously has an advantage for a lot of the kids that are in the state of Texas, but like Ohio State is Ohio State, and they're going to keep plugging away. If you look at this weekend, uh, obviously Jordan Davison was at Austin or in Austin at Texas. Uh, DeCorey and Moore was there. Jamie French was there. Kalik Lockett was there. Jonah Williams was there. Uh, Elijah Barnes was there. I mean, just that group alone, we're talking five guys that were all in Ohio State in the last two weeks. And Jordan Davison's the only one of those guys that's not from Texas. So, like, it's an uphill battle, but the Buckeyes are very much involved. Do you think I'm right about that? Like, is this shaping up to be the next, like, back and forth battle ground between Ohio State, Texas, USC? Because I'm really thinking about NIL, and there's only, I don't know, probably a dozen teams around the country, I think, that have really um, figured this out. And the teams like Ohio State, Texas, USC, in these major metropolises, have something to sell that just no one else really does. And that's like the city that they're in. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you on that. You know, I know I've mentioned Oregon a lot lately too, but obviously that's not that you, you Eugene is in some big city. So I can 100% see this being a uh, kind of common theme over the next few years between Ohio state, USC and Texas. Um, like you mentioned, the NIL is a piece of that too. But, but yeah, I mean, just looking through that list from, from visitors that was in Austin last week. I mean, every, basically every single priority target for Ohio state was, was there. And yeah, Dorian brew was there. Like, I mean, it's just a, a very long list. Yeah. And, and I feel like, um, I don't know, Decorian Moore is probably the one that I would lean towards Texas landing right now, assuming he doesn't end up in Baton Rouge, which I believe we both feel a decommitment will come there eventually. Um, haven't seen much on the Jordan Davis in front. I know he's close with the shard choice there. Um, I don't, Dorian Brew is a fascinating one. I, I have no idea what's happening there with Ohio state's numbers in the secondary and him being down there now, but I mean, it was a huge week in Austin. There's, there's no other way to put it. 
Yeah. Dorian Brew, I think, exemplifies exactly what I'm talking about, about a kid that may very well end up having to decide between those three schools, Ohio State, USC, Texas, um, because each school has a different pull for, for him. Each school has something major to offer. Uh, obviously, you know, the difference, as you said, with a place like Oregon, you're up. It's hard as hell to get to, to Eugene, Oregon. Like, it's not easy to do. You can get to Dallas from anywhere and make that two and a half hour trip to Austin pretty easy. You can fly into Austin pretty much from anywhere at this point. You can get to Columbus from anywhere very easily. You can get to LA from anywhere. Like these are not hard trips to make. And as NIL becomes more wide open, you're going to be able to see schools pay for those trips directly but all the time. And things are going to be a lot easier for these kids to get to those places. And the difference really now in this like world of television, this world of uh, you know, name, image, and likeness, these cities, like they can just flat out meet with like major business leaders, major players in entertainment, major players, uh, in agriculture in Texas. I mean, you could just sit them down with the oil guys. Like it's a different world now. And I really do think that a lot of kids who, who used to like, you know, you'd, you'd go to Tuscaloosa, for example, and like, yeah, this is a college town, right? Like this is a college. Ann Arbor is a great college town. Uh, but Detroit's still 30 minutes away. Like it's not easy. And plus, I, mean, I don't know why anyone would be going to Detroit anyway. Um, like Madison, Wisconsin, like the, those are great college towns. But what you have in a city environment is totally different. Um, Ohio State, Texas, USC, that is just something I'm I'm going to be really watching closely. Uh, and it's starting to percolate in this cycle. I think we'll see a number of those kids that we just talked about coming down to a decision between those schools. Jordan Davison. Uh, it looks like Ohio State or Texas to me there. I know that there's still some talk about Alabama but uh, and, and Michigan, but I just, I just don't buy it. And maybe I'll be wrong. I don't buy the Michigan talk. Uh, I, I do think he likes Alabama, but I don't think that's where he's going to end up. And I think it's Ohio State or Texas. People I've talked to after this weekend didn't seem to feel like Texas did exactly what they needed to do to regain the lead. Um, and, and then they the Longhorns did add a running back commitment while he was on campus. So that's, you know, it's not, not a big deal entirely, but it's, it is something where you look at it and you're like, eh, maybe that doesn't hurt Ohio state. Um, but then you look at the others like Dorian brew, Elijah Barnes. I mean, uh, they're, uh, the, the Kelly Glockets, the Decorian and Moore's like, these are our guys that Ohio state is going to be swinging for until the end. Uh, and Texas now, I think they're probably like tired of seeing Ohio State come in there and take players from Texas. And aside from the Devin Sanchez recruitment this year, uh, historically, if we can go back to J.K. Dobbins and Baron Browning and Jeff Okuda and uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, like so, when Ohio State starts to go all in on a player there, I think we're seeing Texas intentionally ramp up their 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 heat. Yeah, that sounds about right. I I did read on one of the Texas sites that they feel coming out of that visit that it's USC or Texas for Dorian Brew. And I I don't know if you feel that way or if you think that's a possibility or do you think that's far-fetched? I do, I don't know. I I I don't think it's far-fetched to suggest that maybe Ohio State is not in front. Uh, I don't What's interesting is I we obviously read everything people do around the country and and that's part of our job, but you, there's things that are telling and no one has like changed their prediction yet on Dorian brew, despite everyone saying Ohio state's not the lead Ohio. Like I really do think that it's going to be Ohio state, Texas or USC. I buy that. I could buy that USC and Texas may be in front right now. Um, but I don't know that it, it's over by any stretch and, and we'll see what happens. I, the, I think that this is a recruitment that when he decided, when Dorian decided not to commit in January, that the mindset completely shifted. And it's like, hey, I may as well take this as long as I can take it. Um, and he's a player that's good enough that he's not going to be pressured by anybody or rushed into a commitment uh, at any of these schools. And it's just going to come down to what he wants and what his family wants. And I, I could definitely see him at any one of those schools. I'm not trying to um, play both sides against the middle here, but like I, I, I do buy that it is... A, a wide open field, but uh, I, I think that Texas has done a good job uh, making making some moves there. I, I don't know. USC is far away. I mean, even though it's easy to get there, it's still not exactly easy to tell your family, "Hey, I'm moving to LA," unless you're going to be in TV. Remember when Christian uh, Christian Miller from Georgia was like, "I'm going to USC. I want to be on TV," and then like it was Ohio State or Georgia the entire way. It was never really USC. Yeah. Yeah. I do remember that. I, I guess specifically with brew, if, if he wants to play corner and they're going to 
other programs are going to use. Ohio State has three corners committed, then that's going to be tough to overcome, I would think, for Tim Walton and and the Ohio State staff. Yeah, I mean, I think that's when Ohio State will have to make some interesting decisions of their own and so have some interesting conversations of their own. Like, are you willing to, if it came down to that, are you willing to let Dorian Brew go to Texas or, or God forbid, a, 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 in conference school like USC um, for a player maybe that because you have other players that are committed that maybe you don't see that have the same upside? It's it's going to get harder. I mean, the, the recruiting game is going to get harder. It's, it's that I mean, that's one of the things I wrote about on Monday of the things Ohio State needs to figure out over this next few weeks. Like Brian Hartline at wide receiver, like. There's a lot of guys out there, and you have DeCorey and Moore, and you have Jamie French, and you have Khalid Lockett, and you have Vernell Brown, and you have Philip Bell, and you have Taylor Taylor. Like, eventually, you, some of these guys are going to take care of themselves and fall off to the wayside. But you're only going to sign three or four, and you're going to need to make some tough decisions. And you don't ever want to be the school that just takes commitments early and and then moves on from them. But if kids aren't doing the things that they need to do, or aren't you know buying into to making themselves a better football player that uh, if they need to that commitment is a two-way street it's not uh it's not just like hey i'm committed and now i get to do whatever i want and i'll just go to ohio state and be a football player like there are still things that you need to to handle there's still a commitment to the game that you have to make to make sure that you've that you're constantly earning your spot because until you sign that letter of intent no one is safe andrew no one is safe you that's know? true that's true. You're not wrong about that. <laughs> you know who Ohio State fans are feeling uneasy about? Marquise yes, Davis. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You're feeling uneasy about Marquise Davis. And this brings to a bear an interesting question. If Ohio State and new running backs coach Carlos Lachlan land a commitment from Jordan Davison, who Rivals.com has as the number one ranked running back in the country, and Bo Jackson, who Ohio is ranked as the number six running back in the country. And Marquise Davis commits to Michigan without ever even looking into the future and seeing how good these kids become. Are people going to be mad about it? Yes, people will be mad about it. I mean, people will celebrate the additions of Davison and Bo Jackson, but then there is going to be a freak out when, if and when Marquise Davis were to commit to Michigan. And right now, like just me as a fan speculating, like, I feel like that's the most likely outcome right now, um, personally, but yes, there will be a freak out about that. Right. And there shouldn't be, unless to be clear, I mean, now, uh, now if we project into the future and Marquise Davis becomes a better player than them, then we can look back and, and say, well, damn, that was a poor decision. Um, but it's not a matter of Ohio state, not trying to recruit Marquise Davis. That's now underway with Carlos Lachlan, who had no relationship with Davis, when he was at Oregon, that's already begun. We expect to see Marquise Davis on campus this week. I think he'll be there Wednesday. There's a chance he's going to be back Saturday for the spring game. So you might see two visits with him. I think there was maybe a, a track meet or something he had on Saturday, which might throw that uh, off. But you're looking at Ohio State essentially having to start brand new with Marquise Davis. And that is not ideal considering it's April the 8th. Uh, but Carlos Lachlan is beginning that adventure. Ohio State has a number of other players that they are interested in at the position. Uh, Shakai Mills Knight and Dier Dier uh, Hill, who I oh. mentioned last week on this show, as two names to watch. Both of them got offered the next day by uh, Lachlan, and he's begun now talking to other players around the country that he liked. Uh, Byron Lewis will visit this week on, on Wednesday as well. Like, there's a lot of things going on at running back, and Ohio State could probably very well sign two of the top six running backs in the country. But again, I think it's it's interesting. It's it's an interesting look into the psyche of the Ohio State mind, the Ohio State fans' mind right now, because I do agree that people will be more upset that Davis would go elsewhere than they would be happy that they signed. Or, or landed two of the top six. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And I, I feel like they're very different kind of backs. Like just from what I've seen, Davis seems like more of that explosive guy who could put up 600 yards and five touchdowns on a Friday night or something. Whereas the other two are, I don't know if you say more balanced. I don't know. That's just, that's just what I've seen on the brief tapes that I've watched. They're very different kind yeah. of backs, I think. Jordan Davison is playing at modern day high school in California, playing one of the most competitive schedules in the country and playing against 
dozens of Division I players every single Friday night. Like it's a different world. Um, Marquise Davis is special. Like I at six foot one, almost 210 pounds. Like I've seen him in person. I love his skill. I love his film. I think he would be an absolutely dynamic safety if he wanted to play safety. I think Bo Jackson would be a really good linebacker if he wanted to play linebacker. I think there's a way potentially, especially now with Dallin Hayden entering the transfer portal or announcing that he's going to be or report saying he's going to be like, there's a way I think for Ohio state to try and sign three running backs in this class. Uh, knowing that they were this close to doing it in the class of 2024 until Jordan Lyle decommitted uh, on signing day. So I think you have at least the, like you have the architecture in place to, to try to do that, but the relationship has to get there and that is underway, but it is certainly going to be behind where Tony Alford and Michigan are for Marquise Davis, who's now been to Michigan twice in the last 14 days. Like, and that in itself is telling because Alfred, I think, understands that even though, you know, there's a lot of Michigan media hyping up Jordan Davison and a lot of other stuff, I, I don't think I, I think Tony Alfred and Michigan have a of a clear path to stealing Marquise Davis from Ohio State and from Ohio. And that will be celebrated in a major way as a, a as a as a getting one over on Ohio State. But again, if the Buckeyes are signing two of the top six in the country. I don't know that that's a f- accurate way to look at it, but whatever. If, if in my, my head, if they could get Jackson and Davison and then get one of those deer Hill or that other, the other dude they just offered, which I have no idea if that's realistic or not, yeah. but I, I mean, I don't know. I would love to see them sign three, but I have no idea if that's a possibility. Yeah. I think the best case scenario for Ohio state would be to sign or to land two of those top three that we've already talked about over and over, Bo Jackson, Marquis Davis, Jordan Davison, and then maybe a guy like Jeffrey Overton from Virginia, who Buckeyes really like, and he's a big fan of Ohio State. He's more of that shifty slot, uh, you know, um, I don't want to say niche type of guy, but he he's not your traditional every down running back. And I think he's more a player you could slot into that third role. Um, but We'll see how things unfold. Wednesday's a big day for Ohio State, though, when it begins uh, really putting Carlos Lachlan and Marquise Davis and his family in face-to-face situations where they can start uh, building that relationship because Marquise Davis is a little bit aloof, and sometimes he's almost like too cool for school, but that's it, it's just his personality, and I, I personally quite enjoy it because I like talking to the kid a lot, but I, I do wonder if that personality clash will – um, make it difficult for Carlos Lachlan to make up ground because it's he's not a kid that is like warm and fuzzy and open to you know just being t- dabbing everybody up. You know what I mean? Like it's just not his thing. Not his thing. Yeah. You know who is open to dabbing everybody up? Trey McNutt. And Trey McNutt is now dabbing up uh, players all over the state of Ohio because his decision to uh, accept or essentially force a suspension from. The Ohio High School uh, Athletic Association um, it has been reversed, and he, you know, he he opened the door for Ohio players to play seven on seven, which is awesome, and be able to do so anywhere they want and around the country. You know, prior to mid May, which was the rule before, and they were only allowed to play with their high school team. Now, what that will do is it means like guys like Albert Hill, for example, at, at Akron Hoban, class of twenty twenty six cornerback that Ohio State is all over won't be at Ohio State this weekend because he's going to be playing in Dallas as well uh, in the seven-on-seven tournament. So um, big news for Trey McNutt. He also dropped a top eight on uh, April 8th. Uh, I don't know that there's really anything like surprising about it, Andrew. Is there anything that you saw or or anything about his top eight, which is Florida, Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, Oregon, Tennessee, Texas A&M, and USC? Uh, was there anything about that group that like caught you off guard or you're like, ooh, interesting? No, not at all, honestly. Like I've just long assumed the kid is going to end up at Ohio State after doing his due diligence, which he's clearly doing. Um, I, I really have no idea like how what his hierarchy would be like if you have Ohio State at one Ohio State at one, who would be the number two and three teams? I really have no idea. Um, I I did see some interesting rumblings this weekend about Miami. Uh passing on him and not being interested in him. So it's funny how that works out with, uh, with fan bases from across the country. Um, but, but no, I did not, I did not have any surprises on his list at all, honestly. 
I, I don't know that I would believe that Miami is not uh, would would say no. I, I guess I'm surprised Michigan's on the list because I don't I just don't think it's a realistic option at this point. I, I think that you, when you're looking at Trey McNutt, I think Ohio State is certainly very much in the picture. Texas A and M has been rising in that picture. Uh, USC again, I think is real. Uh, Tennessee, I think is real. Um, and um, Oregon, I think is real. But I don't know that I really buy much else on that group. But doesn't matter and that's the beauty of it what does matter is that ohio state has him fahim delane uh cody haddad uh Kainoa winston and jonah williams and 17 other safeties on their board uh essentially with one committed and deshaun stevens and 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 now you are sorry deshaun stewart and you are telling the other guys there's three spots left i think that's the goal right now probably four safeties in this class so if we can start operating from that vantage point that perspective it does make it easier to see how all of this works out if you think four safeties three corners i think that's that's the way i would view things from here and then wherever dorian brew falls into that middle part you know i think as we said then you start to maybe make some decisions after that but um there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts a lot of moving parts and a lot a lot of things going on go ahead with McNutt, then, is the uh, the question of where he's going to be playing his senior season probably like no longer a question then due to that ruling change, or what do you know about that? I don't know for sure, but I would imagine that that uh, should alleviate the concern. I, I still have heard rumblings that you know there's uh, to talk about IMG, there's talk about maybe moving down to Tennessee, talk about going out to California. Like there are discussions being had about having almost like a semi pro high school league. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, like around the country, like essentially turning, like creating an, a high school NIL showcase instead of like guys actually playing football for their high schools. Like there's discussion about that. I've actually seen Dorian Bruce link name link to that, um, f- which would be interesting. So I think you're going to find out pretty quickly when kids start making these like huge, weird decisions where people's priorities really are. Um, uh, I, I don't. I, I talk to Trey a lot. I mean, he seems to be very uh, purposeful in what he's doing, and his his motto of for the kids. Like, he, I think he knows that he's trying to provide a good example and be like the the shining star for the kids in Shaker Heights and uh, other kids around Ohio. And uh, his, his YouTube channel is doing a great job, like finding ways to connect with people. I I still think. Trey McNutt and Ohio State are a really good fit, and so I would I would expect that that's where it'll end up. If he leaves the state for high school, for senior year of high school, then things get a little bit funky, but who knows? There's a lot to talk about, Andrew. There's a college basketball game on uh, shortly, and, and I wanted to wrap this up and hopefully get this online before then. So let's jump into our four-minute offense and, and dive into any extra things that are on your mind before we call it quits on this episode of Talking Stuff. Yeah, we sh- actually should be able to keep it at four minutes this time because I've really only got one thing to even mention. So um, Naeem offered... Visiting Georgia this week, I believe. Maybe I don't know if it's like on his way to Columbus. He's stopping there. I'm not sure what the itinerary is like. But we said back when he committed, you know, this these this is going to happen. But yeah. any any thoughts on that, or just kind of that's just what's going to happen. It's just what's going to happen. Uh, and Oregon is also on the list for a visit. Uh, I think at the end of this month. So this is the world we live in. It sucks. It's unfortunate. But it, the key for Ohio State, the key for Tim Walton is. Are these kids being upfront with me about what they're doing? Are these kids making sure that they're not trying to be uh, sneaky or, you know, are, are their families pulling over a fast one or, or, and they aren't. And so even kids, I mean, we saw it with the TJ Alford commitment 10 days ago, like it, before he committed, he said, I'm going to ask my coaches and make sure that I'm able to, to go and visit elsewhere. And, and they said, yes. So like these discussions happen, I think it's actually interesting when it comes to guys like Tim Walton and Brian Hartline from a year ago, and now now we see it maybe starting to percolate a little bit with with James Laurinaitis, it's like the confidence that those coaches have in what they are producing and what Ohio State provides allows them the 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 peace to say, go ahead, visit elsewhere, and I guarantee you, you're not going to find what you found at Ohio State. And maybe it's a coincidence that those three guys who I just mentioned all played at Ohio State. They all know exactly what the Ohio State experience 
did for them. And if you listen to James Laurinaitis talk, uh, if you listen to Brian Hartline talk, if you listen to Tim Walton talk about what Ohio State did for them as as young men, I think they find themselves much more comfortable allowing their commitments to just find out for themselves. Now, nobody wants that to be the case. Nobody wants these kids to be out and putting themselves in front of other coaches and in front of other NIL opportunities, but you're you're also not going to stop it. I mean, there's for these top 10 t- kids in the country, the offers that's just not going to happen. I mean, if if Tavian St. Clair really wanted to engage in this sort of stuff, like he could do the same thing. Like there's nothing that's going to stop any of these kids other than um than making sure that they're making the right decision. And you know, Naeem offered visited Ohio State twice. That second visit that he made committed basically out of the blue. Like there's a lot of things probably that are opening up in front of him that he's probably going, well, now I got to check this out. Now I got to check this out. But as we always say, like it's better to be in front than trailing. And so Ohio State is certainly in front. Um, but none of these kids, with the exception of probably, uh, you know, Eli Lee or Tavian St. Clair, should you look at and feel like oh, I'm a thousand percent comfortable. Even, even Devin Sanchez, who is like Mr. Buckeye in this class, like if six months from now, if something came up, like he's going to have to take those same sort of uh, opportunities and 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 look at them as well. So you got to hope that now you just keep building on what you have. And what you'd really like is Naeem offered and Devin Sanchez to spend their whole weekend together in Columbus this weekend, which they'll do, and and realize, hey man, we have an opportunity to be to be something really crazy good in Columbus. And if it means comparing that to Georgia, so be it. Yeah, makes sense. Um, last one real quick. So after the, uh, Eli Lee commitment way back when, and we started to kind of piece together Lauren Itis's board, uh, TJ Alford obviously was a big name, but then that Elijah Melendez kid that's committed to Miami now, um, yep. sounded like Ohio state was like maybe number two for him for a bit. And then he committed to Miami. I saw something on Twitter yesterday about taking a multi-day visit to Michigan. Is that, is, is him and Ohio state just kind of dead in the water? Or do you think there's any like traction or reason to even pay attention to that one anymore? Uh, I fully expect Elijah Melendez will take an official visit to Ohio State. He's got some family up in the Detroit area, so that's what that's what it's about. He's actually like from Colorado, so you'll see more visits to Colorado. He's got family in Detroit. His dad grew up a Michigan fan, so like you'll see him up there. He loves James Laurinaitis. Ohio State is still on the official visit list if the Buckeyes decide to go through with that. I don't know if they will or not, to be honest. I mean, if if that visit doesn't happen, it's because Ohio State pulled the plug on it and said it's not necessary. Um you have linebackers like Elijah Barnes, like we already talked about, uh, Riley Pettijohn, another one in Texas. Like, so I think that the Buckeyes are more focused there. Um, but the relationship with Elijah Melendez and James Laurinaitis has been really good. Um, but again, a kid, he he was gung ho, gung ho, gung ho about Ohio State and committed to Miami in on one visit, and um, we'll see. It's a different world. I don't. I, I would not. I would not expect uh, him to flip to Michigan, however. Got it. That's all I got. All right. Well, hopefully everyone can get uh, this episode underway as they start watching Purdue and UConn in the national championship game tonight. Andrew, who do you got? I had UConn winning it all in my bracket, which is completely ruined, but I'll just, I'll just roll with UConn. Why not? Yeah. I think they're going to win by like 20 plus. I don't think it's going to be close. So um, I want to make sure this is on the record. It's now eight 53 as we're wrapping this up. So if I'm wrong, Sorry, if I'm right, make sure everyone tells me how great I am. Um, anyway, thanks for watching Talking Stuff. Uh, this is on the podcast. As always, please rate, review, subscribe. Let's tell your friends about what we do here, and uh, we look forward to talking to you next time. See ya.